Hello, this is Frugal and welcome back to part three of our DC-9 review flight. Now, you'll remember the first part we started up the aircraft, taxi the runway. The second part, we actually flew a SID, which is a standard instrument departure, showing you how to do that with the DC-9, which is pretty neat and uh, interesting to do because the DC-9 doesn't have a GPS on all the modern navigation equipment that we're used to from things like the 737 NGX. Now we're on approach, or we're gonna be on approach. We are flying to Amsterdam, and in this video, we're going to be descending, obviously, approaching and landing. And I want to talk to you about stars, because I wanted to fly a star with this. Now, the challenging thing with stars, here's a star right here. What a star is, is a uh, standard terminal arrival route. Basically, it provides, think of it as a funnel. If you have all the aircraft in the air, all spread out all over the place, heading towards an airport, a star puts them into a funnel, so they all pop out the sharp end of the funnel in a nice orderly line, which air traffic control can then manage. You basically have multiple stars into an airport, depending on where you're coming from. So typically, if you're using a flight planner like FS Build, the last waypoint on your route will actually be the start of a star. So if you actually key in into FS Build or go and look it up online in one of the online flight planners, uh, London Gatwick to Amsterdam, you will find that one of the waypoints or the last waypoint prior to the airport is actually something called Redfa, which is, let me see if I can find a star here. We're looking at NDAC again from Navigraph. Here we go. Now, NDAC doesn't give you that many stars for... Um, Amsterdam here, which is a bit of a tricky thing for us. Let me find... Here we go. If we're approaching from the northwest, though, this is the star. Now, here's the challenge here. This star requires you to have radar navigation, RNAV, um, and we don't. So normally, we wouldn't actually follow this star. Normally, we would follow preset waypoints. We would call into a traffic control. They would vector us. You can see here, radar vectoring, we performed final approach, um, and that's how things would go. I am deviating from realism in this just to show how you would navigate a little bit. So here is Redfer. So actually on the flight plan, Clacton, CLN was over here. Then you're going to fly to Redfer. This is where the video is going to pick up, right about Redfer. And you can see that it's actually very hard to navigate. Everything in, in here is a GPS waypoint or an RNAV waypoint. I, I get those two terms confused, but it's basically a GPS waypoint, which we can't use. So S-U-L-U-T here, uh, Sierra Uniform, Lima Uniform Tango is a GPS waypoint. Uh, same up here for Sugol, although no, Sugol's not actually. Rob V is, Lutex is, Monil is. That gives us some challenges. Well, what we're going to do is we are going to assume that Redfa is on the 060 radial all the way up to here, this VOR, which is Den Helder. So we're going to fly that until we intercept. So we're going to deviate a little bit from this star until we intercept. Uh, actually, that's very close there, isn't it? But until we intercept the 292 radial to Schiphol, which is Amsterdam. At that point, we're going to be starting to fly the approach. Now, a star is the standard terminal arrival route. And then typically on the end of a star, you have something called a transition. So having chosen a runway or being told which runway you're going to land on, you would then have a, a transition off the end of the star to line you up onto the runway. We are going to land on runway 18 right, because obviously we're not using a traffic control here. Everything is a little bit fake, because I really want to exercise all the equipment that we've got in the DC-9. Um, and to do so would really require a traffic control to start vectoring us, and we're not going to do that. So if we're going to land on runway 18 right, let me just key that in here. Here is runway 18 right. We have arrival routes here. This is the standard RNAV arrival route at night. Now, obviously, we can't follow that too well. Look at these waypoints up here. We have no way of identifying where this waypoint is, which is a bit of a challenge. So we're going to kind of mix things up a little bit. We want to land ILS runway 18 right. So this is what we're going to do. So we're actually going to, once we intercept the radial, here from Sugol. Let me, I can't bring back that star, but once we get to the Sugol waypoint on the star, we're going to turn, we're going to fly on that 112 degrees down to Schiphol, then a fairly hard turn to intercept the 338 degree radio from Schiphol until we are 12.1 miles away at 3000 feet. We will start a right turn and intercept the 183 radio onto the ILS. Simple. Now, an ILS is really just a VOR that has a glide slope attached. It is as simple as that. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that, actually, but you get the idea. Think of it as a VOR with a, with a, a glide slope attached. So once we get here, or once we get here and we start this turn, we're going to tune the radio to 110.1. .1. We're going to set the course as 183. You will see glide slope alive. It will start moving up on the uh, uh, indicators on the dashboard, and we'll start following that glide slope down and hopefully landing runway 18 right. But obviously, the key thing here with the DC 9 is 
lots of radio work, lots of tuning the radios, lots of tuning radials, lots of trying to intercept things. And as you saw in a previous video, that gets a little bit odd with this DC-9 because it's not that good at capturing a radial. This particular turn here, there is no way it's gonna do that. So what we're actually gonna do is probably overshoot. We will do a right turn of all things. We'll do a right turn all the way around and then fly up that way. That's actually a lot easier to intercept than trying to do this hideously sharp turn here. Anyway, enough talking, and I know, as I've said before and in the previous video, this is not my usual level of ultra uber realism. That's not the point of this series of videos. The point of this series of videos is to fly the DC-9 and try to follow a semi-realistic real-world procedure because the aircraft is not designed to do that, um, which makes it fun and interesting. Anyway, see you in the cockpit. All right, so here we are back in the cockpit. We're approaching Clacton, CLN, Charlie Lima, November. And at that point, to get us on course towards Redfur, we're gonna to have to turn onto the 072 radio, which I've already got dialed in down here. We're nine miles away. So we're not gonna have much success in making the DC-9 capture that radio straight away. So we'll just manually turn onto that heading and then capture it later on. And then we will be into the star. This is actually why I choose this route quite a lot. It's the, sorry, yeah, the star. The, the SIDS and the stars between Gatwick and Amsterdam are actually very, very close together. Let me just change my papers here. Now, incidentally, while we're climbing up, a little trick for you with the DC-9. You saw me in the last video rolling this pitch wheel. There's another way of doing it. You can set your speed, and then down here, tell the autopilot system to hold your indicated airspeed, and then just increase the throttles. If you increase the throttles, it will change your, your rate of... It will make you climb, basically, to slow down rather than gain speed. Um, which is a very handy way of managing your climb. That's what I'm currently doing right now. Okay, so five miles out from Clacton now. Climbing to an altitude of 21,000 feet or flight level 210. All the lights are off, as you saw in the last video. We're all good to go. Now, you know when you're overflying a VOR if this changes. 1,000 to go. So you can see this little white arrow is actually pointing towards the VOR. It's kind of over there. Once we pass it, it will flick down to show that we passed it. That's the point at which we can turn. All right, so we're coming up on our altitude now. We'll put altitude hold on so we hold at flight level 210. I've already reduced my throttles, which is where the speed is actually a little bit low for this altitude. But I didn't want to have like 4,000 feet per minute rate of climb. Let's turn that off. and turn it back on now. There we go. Now we can pick up our speed. We're at a cruise altitude. We have passed the Clacton VOR now, so we'll change this into heading mode, which I will need to turn this. It's already in heading mode. We'll turn this around here. Now we're gonna proceed on this radial for 50 miles. So you're gonna see five zero up here. Once we are 50 miles away from Clacton, on this radial, we are at the Redfer waypoint, at which point we're going to turn right onto a heading of 060. Now there's two ways we can do this. Bearing in mind, as I said in the introduction, <coughs> the star we're following is not designed for this kind of aircraft. We don't have the right equipment to follow a true star uh, of this nature in this aircraft. So I can either, once I hit Redfer, turn to 060 for 40 degrees, or, sorry, for 40 miles, or I can just turn to 060 and leave it there until we intercept the radial down to Schiphol, which is what I'm going to do. So it's it's kind of a, a little bit weird. It's just going to be very, very hard to measure 40 miles from Redfur because Redfur is a waypoint. It's not a VOR or anything like that. Now, by the way, our uh, Redfur constraint on the star is that we need to be 260 to 280 knots. We're a little bit too high for that right now. And we need to be at or below flight level 230. So we are, we are at or below flight level 230. I'm, I'm gonna reduce the speed though. And now we're 13 miles away from Clacton. Let's switch that into nav lock. <coughs> and we will get onto that radial. So we'll fly most of the star in the correct place, as it were. Actually, there is a way of measuring. Once we get to Redfur, if we turn 060, if we then tune the radios to HDR, which is what we were gonna follow initially, in fact, that's what we're gonna follow from Redfur, when we are 
let me see, 56 and a half miles away from HDR. That's when we would turn 077. So we will do that. Refer to the start of this video if you want to see that in more detail. I really don't like how this DC-9 captures radials. It's a little funky. So coming up on 20 miles away from Clacton now, remember 50 miles is where the Redford waypoint is. I'm reducing my throttles just to try to get the speed down to 280, which is the upper speed constraint for Redford. We will be starting our descent at Redford as well. Um, if we're following the star, Sugol, the, the key waypoint into Amsterdam, kind of the end of the funnel, has a constraint of 10,000 feet. We need to be at 10,000 feet at Sugol, so we will actually start descending once we hit Redfer. This particular DC-9 does actually descend very well. Uh, as That is to say, it's, it's not like the 737 NGX. It doesn't pick up speed too much. It's fairly easy to control. There's the coast of Holland over there in the distance. You can see it's not very far away. There's England right there. There's Holland right there. You can see why we got invaded so much. There we go. 260, 270-ish. Just increase the throttles just to keep my speed about there. 26 miles away from Clacton. So we might as well turn in, tune in that um, direction change. We're going to turn. Now I don't like this. It says on my charts. Oh no, it's not a right turn. It just looks like a right turn, but it's not a right turn. It's actually a slightly left turn to zero six zero. Good. So that's already set up. Once we hit fifty miles, we will put this into heading hold. It will turn to zero six zero. Then we'll start looking at the descent. Now I'm not using real weather, the weather is fixed, so the pressure is 299 at 2. I will dial that up now. There we go. Don't need to worry about that, we're not using ATC, the focus is really on flying this aircraft. While we're here, now is probably a good time to talk through some more features of this aircraft and some more things I like and dislike. Overall, my impression of this aircraft is I like it very much. Somebody just messaged me earlier on YouTube and said that this is, or does appear, similar in complexity to the NGX, which is, I think I said that in the previous video as well. It is, it really is, but where in the NGX you're learning a lot of computers and a lot of systems management, in this you're learning how to fly the aircraft and navigate. I think the big feature here is managing the aircraft, managing those engines, and navigating correctly. It's a, a big challenge and a very rewarding one if you do fly a procedure properly as we're trying to do right here, even though you're not equipped to do so. And also if you minimize the cheats, you know, I'm popping up NavSim quite a lot to tune my radios just because it's easier to do than clicking down on the individual dials. But even so, even using that cheat is still immensely satisfying. And it's, it's quite a nice look back in time at how airliners used to fly only about 30 years ago or less. So we're at 38 miles now, not far to go. I did find something else out as well. I kept on having to change my view to get to these radios. This armrest lifts up. You can just click on it. It makes it very easy to get to the radios and to get to the Sperry Autopilot down here. Very useful. I like the modeling in this. Oh, I've got to point out, Cool Sky. Uh, sorry, McFat. Um, those guys at McFat um, have messaged me a number of times. I have spoken to them a number of times, both on Facebook and on YouTube. They're great guys. Very, very good guys. Terence at McFat messaged me to point out, I said that McFat had done the texturing inside the cockpit uh, and the texturing outside the cockpit. That's what they'd done. Wrong. McFat had actually done all of the 3D modeling. So this exquisite model that you have out here, that is all McFat's work as well. So CoreSky were really working on the systems simulation and the flight model and stuff like that. McFat did all the visuals. So everything you're seeing visually is the incredible work of McFat Studios. They are an incredible bunch of guys, very, very talented bunch of guys and girls. I've got to point out Sarah there. I think it's Sarah works there. Um, not just guys. So credit where credit's due. All right, 46 miles. Now also for that altitude constraint, there's obviously a speed constraint, 10,000 feet. We also need to be down to 250 on the speed. 
getting closer to Holland now. I will put the caveats out here. I am running the Aerosoft uh, Amsterdam Extreme scenery, which immensely hurts my frame rates. So if this gets very jerky as we come into land, it's, it's not the pilot, it's the scenery. Okay, so we're turning now onto the heading of 060. What I'm going to do is tune. Now we're going to be slightly off course, so I can't follow this to the letter, but I'm going to tune HDR on the radios which is actually 115.55 but we'll do it through an app sim here zoom out HDR is there double click that should be 115.55 which it is the Sierra Uniform Lima Uniform Tango Waypoint is 56 and a half miles away so we're gonna have to use our judgment a little bit it's gonna be like 55 to 60 miles away because we are gonna be slightly off course there is a little wind here we need to bear that in mind. But what we will start doing now is change our altitude and start descending. So we're going to descend down to flight level of 100, 10,000 feet. As you remember from the previous video, this is just an alerter. It's just a reminder. As you get close to that, you'll start hearing beep in the cockpit telling you you're getting close. You don't actually have um, VNAV in this aircraft as such. So I'm reducing my throttles now. It's going to cause us to pitch up a little bit. The autopilot is going to try to hold the altitude, so we'll put in some descent there. Going to descend at about 2,000 feet per minute. Backing off the engines a little bit. You can see the engine RPMs dropping. Can probably afford to descend a little quicker than that. Our speed is dropping. Like I said, the DC-9 as modeled here does descend very well obviously I've never flown a DC-9 in real life I don't know whether that's accurate there it goes feels a bit like an Airbus in how it descends very well managed now speed is coming down as well in all the big jets the key to managing a descent is managing your speed and something a little trick you can do in the NGX if, if it does get a little slippery for you and it is does have a tendency to is actually to bleed your speed before you descend so bleed the speed right down to about 220 then put in your fairly serious rate of descent and if the speed picks up it's not a big problem you're not going to um, break your over speed limit you're not going to break your altitude speed constraints that's another trick there in the Airbus and in this DC-9 not such a big issue I could arm the speed brakes if I wanted to at this point there's no need I'm descending at what 2100 feet per minute right now speed is nice it's about 260 by the time we get to that uh, salute waypoint then we will be at 250 and flight level 100 what I am going to do though is try to come out of this descent smoothly rather than just a jarring yank on the yoke from the autopilot when I put on altitude hold I'm going to use that um, pitch wheel down here to try to smooth the descent a little bit make it better for the passengers now I know that sounds a little silly to say we don't have passengers and everything else but you know the whole point of flying these flight sims is to sim, is to simulate. Uh, so if you're going to simulate, it makes sense that you try to do things as realistically as possible. And that includes managing the aircraft in such a way that your virtual passengers in the back seats don't scream, don't cry. And A to A simulations are actually very good at that. If you look at their uh, captain of the ship expansion, that thing's phenomenal. And you hear the passengers in the back and you will get babies crying if you descend too hard or you don't match the, the pressure in the cabin to the outside air pressure and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty wild. It's, it's worth checking out that particular aircraft as well. I should do some videos on that at some point. I just have too many videos to do right now. All right, 72 miles away. We are looking at 56 to 60 miles away. Remember, this is tuned to HDR which is to the north of Amsterdam uh, Schiphol Airport, so it's about up there. In fact, you can see if you follow that needle, it's going to be about there. And when we get there, we are going to turn right to a heading of 077 to intercept the 292 radial from Schiphol. Now, it's the 292 radial from Schiphol because it's 292 degrees from Schiphol. So the actual radial we're going to be on, if I look at this actual uh, approach chart here, 
we're going to be heading on 112, so the reciprocal of 292 is actually 112. We could tune either. I want to answer some of the questions I've been getting. I've been getting a lot of questions. By the way, thank you for all your support. I know a number of you now have joined the Facebook page that we've got set up. It's facebook.com slash frugalsim. Thank you very much for that. It's, it's great speaking with you guys and getting feedback in a more um, instantaneous method, I guess, than YouTube and having conversations with you as well, which is very hard to do on YouTube. So check it out if you're not already a member, facebook.com slash frugalsim. Thank you for joining those of you that have. I get a lot of requests. A number of you have asked, how the hell do I run two computers? At the same time, normally in my videos, I'm running at least two computers. There's actually sometimes three running um, with all my add-ons spread across all of them. I have thought about doing a video on that. It's tricky to do. I get a lot of requests already from people asking me to give them hints and tips on how to set up FSX. I don't really want to get inundated with those simply because I don't have the time to answer all those in detail. And I would always point you to forums like Absim to try to get help. So my big fear with doing that particular video is getting inundated with those requests. I don't want to. We'll see though. I am thinking about how I would possibly do that video. Got to watch this distance. 60 miles. We're going to turn at... It's dropping quite nicely. We're gonna, we are going to turn at about 57. So that's the first request. Second request, people have been asking me, can I do a video or 1, to go. share my FS config? Let me smooth out this descent. No, I can't share my FS config. I actually tweak my FS config every week. I tweaked it before I did this video. Um, it changes all the time. It's pointless on me, me doing a video on, on what my FS config is like because it is so highly tuned to my machine and my preferences. I would urge you all, if you're interested in tweaking FSX, to get really good frame rates, to go and check out Costas's FSX tweaking guide over at Avsim. Once again, I keep mentioning Avsim. I'm not affiliated with them. Honestly, I've had more fights on there than I care to even remember. Um, it is a bit of a brutal forum, but it is a wealth of good information. Well worth checking out. All right, let's start this turn now on to 077 which I think is about there. It's never going to be accurate tuning a, a needle visually like that. I've got to watch my speed now. We are under 10,000 feet. I actually want it to be at 10,000 feet. Now because we're under 10,000 feet it is customary to turn landing lights on, which we will do. Not the nose lights, not the proper final big nose lights, but we will turn the landing lights on. Okay, watching my speed here, just trying to manage my speed a little bit. We do need to tune the radios now to Schiphol SPL Sierra Papa Lima on 108.4, which I will do using NAVSIM. So, SPL should be off to my right. Now, I always do this, and I'm always looking, I'm like, I can't see it. And then we look at the video afterwards, and everybody's like, Frugo, it was right there. But you know what? I can't see it. I can see SPI. I can't see it. There it is, there it is, there it is. It's going to be hard to pick that out, so I am going to do it by hand. Watching my speed a little bit. Hang on, let's back off that speed a touch. So, SPL is 108.4. There. And we want to intercept 292 or 112. I'm going to put 112. Now, we will actually fly on this course to intercept that radial for 21 miles, which isn't a lot of time. So I'm just grabbing my papers here. Yes, it is 112. It's 31 miles into uh, Amsterdam Schiphol from here. And our constraints are at the point of that turn, 10,000 feet, 250 knots. Okay, it's moving already, so let's flick this over, nav lock. Hopefully this DC-9 doesn't do that and do a really hard turn. There's no need for it. Once it actually makes the turn onto that radial, we will start our descent down to, what is our next constraint here? 3,000 feet. 
ready for approach to runway 18 right. All right, so there it goes. Let's go ahead and dial this down. Now the same trick that I mentioned for climbing, setting a vertical speed hold, or sorry, setting an indicated airspeed hold on, on the autopilot actually works for descent as well. Look at this, I can say IAS hold, which is 230, and just drop the throttles off. Which I've just done. And look at that, we are now descending. And I can control my rate of descent at this point with the throttles. Okay, let's bring up the speed cards. We want landing speed cards. We are going to be landing at 40 degrees of flaps. Transfer those bugs in. There's the stages of the flaps right there. So our landing speed is 130. Now once we overfly Schiphol, we're going to take that right turn and then try to intercept the 338 radial as we come out of the right turn. I'm going to do something I've not done in this DC-9, which is actually use this turn dial. So once we overfly that, I'm going to twist that turn dial around and try to get a 30 degree turn and hold a fairly constant 30 degree turn. I could fly it manually, but I don't think real world pilots would on an approach like this. They'd be managing too many other things and checking checklists and reading maps and charts the same as I am. So I am going to do it with the autopilot. But it's not an autopilot in any NGX sense of the word as you've already seen. There's the airport directly ahead. Oh actually my altitude constraint is wrong. I'm reading rereading the chart. It says flight level seven zero to overfly the airport. So that's where we're gonna be. I need to level this off once we hit seven zero. So I will do that. I'm gonna leave our alerter at three thousand because we are gonna use that once we overfly. I was thinking it was a bit dangerous to overfly the airport at three thousand. That makes sense. Hopefully I don't completely cock this approach up, which is possible. Altitude hold, there we go. Stabilizer motion. I'm gonna keep the speed up for now. Once we overflash Gibble and we did our right turn and we intercept the radio that we want, we are gonna be flying 12 miles out from this beacon. Then we will start our right turn to intercept the ILS, which is on 110.1 on a course of 183. For runway 18 right. Whoops. Speed, speed. Said I'm going to keep the speed up and then let it drop. 22 miles out right now. I could start extending flaps right now, but I'd rather not. I'd rather do things more realistically, so let's get that speed up. Probably around about 230, 240. I always get asked on these videos what add-ons you're running, what scenery. I've already said the scenery that we're landing at is the frame rate killer Aerosoft Amsterdam Extreme or Amsterdam X or Mega Amsterdam or whatever they call it. The Aerosoft Amsterdam scenery. That's about it. I'm not running Active Sky right now. The cloud textures are still from Rex though. Obviously this is the Flight 1 Cool Sky McFat DC9 which is just amazing. I love it. Other than that, I'm flying with a Cytec yoke, ProFlight yoke, um, throttle quadrant over here, pedals. I actually have a Cytec switch box as well that I'm using today, which actually doesn't work with the DC-9. The only thing that I'm using on it is the gear lever, just because I like grabbing a big chunky gear lever and pulling the gear down, as you would do in a real cockpit, that thing. 17 miles out. I am a little high. I should be at flight level 70. I'm not at flight level 71. I'm 
was a little bit over eager with the altitude hold I think there we go stabilizer motion You can just about see Amsterdam out the window there, or Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, I should say. Let's see if we can get a view from back here. There it is. Obviously, I'm not following the full checklist. As I said in the previous video, the checklists are immense. I have not mastered them yet. I would like to. It's just a question of time, and you guys keep asking for all sorts of different videos. So we shall see. Ten miles out from the airport, there is a Schiphol. Let me see if I can move us a little closer. There we go. So that's our runway right there. Runway 18 right, this one camera is being moved with easy dot camera probably my favorite utility of all and there go my frame rates god 8 miles out all right let's start dropping that speed down now towards 210 Now, as I said, I've not used that turn control on the autopilot yet. I should have. I should have practiced before I recorded this, so this might go horribly wrong. Speed's coming down now. Two, three, zero. Five miles. Four miles. I actually want to completely overfly that uh, VOR, otherwise it's going to be tricky to intercept the 338 radial that we want. All right, let's go flaps. Flats extended. Flats, I should say. We'll hold this speed. And as we come out on the radial that we want, we'll drop first stage of flaps. All about managing the throttles now on the airspeed. waiting for that arrow to flick to show we've overflown see if I can get a view here where I can see that turn wheel and I can see my HSI there we go we just overflew it so start a turn ah oh, good the turn goes the wrong way we want to turn to the right I want 30 degrees. Let's get the speed up. Again, that wheel's backwards. I'm rolling my mouse wheel the wrong way. But anyway, so let's dial in 338 now. Watching my speed as well while I do this. There we go. And we can start our descent now down to 3000, a nice gentle, fairly gentle descent. About 1500 feet. There it is. You're not going to do it, are you? Alright, 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 keep going, keep going. Around you go. Well, we said we might cock up, and we did. Ease up on the throttles. Gonna try to get a 45 degree intercept on this radial here. Descending at 6400 now, flight level 64. 
pull back on those throttles, keep the speed down. Must be over Amsterdam because my frame rate just went through the floor. There we go. See, now I would think to roll my mouse wheel down, but I actually have to roll it up to come out of this turn. Which is the strangest thing. There we go. Reset my view. I'm sure you saw on that view change there, it got a little jerky. Let's turn this off. And then put this on. So nav lock is now on. We are one mile away, so we're actually overflying Schiphol now. That turn worked out really well. Nav lock is on. We should start turning. Nope. Okay, let me manually do that. to there okay speed down we want to be at 3,000 feet at 12 miles away we are three miles away currently gonna turn altitude 1, to go. off it's the outer marker it doesn't mean anything because we're not landing at this point Watching that altitude there, want to intercept 3,000 feet. Get the speed down to 200. And we will go first stage of flaps. Okay, coming up on the localizer now. There we go, nav lock. Stabilizer motion. 3,000 feet. First stage of flaps. Flaps five. Might as well bring my engines up a little. Stabilizer motion. Hideously sharp turn. Keep the speed down at this point. Looks like we're getting established on course at 8 miles. We want to be 12.1 when we turn. We might be a little bit beyond that, which is just fine. I'd rather do it further out than closer in. There we go. Looks like we're established on course, so I'm going to turn this heading bug round to line up with our current course so that in a second I can switch everything around on the radios. This is where it's all going to go wrong. 10 miles out. So let's start bringing our speed down a bit more. Next stage of flaps. We're coming up on 11 miles out now. Now course is 180, 183 sorry to intercept, there's 12 miles out right there, so let's roll this around, get our turn going, next stage of flaps, flaps 15, power up, to compensate, Bring up the nav sim 
in fact I won't I will just do it on the radios down here which is 110.1 I'm trying to watch that speed as well 110.1 there less power and a course of 183 Oh, so hard to turn this thing. 180818283. Let's get our turn going a bit more. Speed down, please. And we will put this into ILS capture. already on. Looking to see that little yellow bar move which would indicate localizer alive. There's the glide slope. Flaps 25. I can see the runway out the window. A lot more power now, please. Localizer there we go. capture. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is, ILS. Okay, it's a little bit clunky trying to intercept that. We're starting our descent now. Ugh, what a turn. I feel nauseous. Alright, it's captured the glide slope. I just saw a light come on saying GP cap, which means glide path capture. There's runway 18 right. I'm going to let this establish us before we disconnect everything. Localizer capture. Mm hmm. Come on, dude, you got to clean this up. I may end up flying this manually sooner than I thought. All right, gear down. All the lights on. Gear down and locked. Next stage of flaps. Flaps 40. Bring our speed down now, which will help us in getting established. All right, now try to set the throttles to hold a fairly constant approach speed. Completely watching that speed dial right now. No auto land in this aircraft, but you do use the autopilot to establish yourself correctly. Let's off. I have control. Be afraid. Watching my 1, speed. Feet. Watching my rate of descent. Controlling my rate of descent with the throttles. Not the yoke. Or well, that that was the yoke. What? Don't judge me. A little bit too low. Let's have a bit more power in there, that will slow our rate of descent. When I say a little bit, I mean a huge amount. There we go. Now come off it.
aircraft doesn't actually feel very well trimmed. A little bit too high now. 500 feet. This aircraft does have reverses. I don't think we're going to use them. The runway is very long. 300 feet. It's nice and dry. A little bit 200 low. 200 feet. It's not a big deal, honestly. Now it's a big deal. Decision altitude plus 100. Yeah, landing. 100 feet. Okay, let's slow that rate of descent. 50. 30. 30. I'm pretty happy with that landing. All right, start slowing down. Sixty knots. If I had used reverses, I could have taken that flaps, taxiway. Flaps, flaps, flaps up, slats retracted. Not a big deal. We'll just take the next one. I don't like that glitch where I get um, smoke in the cockpit from the wheels. And there we are, ladies and gents. Welcome to Amsterdam Schiphol. And the end of this DC-3 review. I'm not going to do the full taxi. We are quite a way out, and it is a long taxi. I'll just park it up here, give you my impressions. So I guess, you know, I've mentioned a couple of times the aircraft still has some bugs. Most aircraft do, honestly. Most add-on aircraft really do. Um, Parking brake set. So should you get it? Well, first, there's a couple of things you've got to consider. It's got some bugs. You need to be able to put up with those bugs. They're not killers. Um, I had a lot of problems with it because of how much I've tweaked FSX. As soon as I remove some of those tweaks, then everything was good and I don't have a problem. The next issue obviously is frame rates. I get the same performance out of this that I do the 737 NGX from PNDG. So if your computer can handle that aircraft, it can handle this aircraft. In fact, if it can handle any PNDG aircraft, then it can handle this. If, however, your computer is struggling with the default aircraft, you won't like this. This will kill your frame rates. Um, other than that, this is probably one of my favorite aircraft right now. I, I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about it and really digging in to the checklist and learning all the procedures and doing things really, really accurately. So that's it. Let me know in the comments below what you think of this video, this series, and my opinion on this aircraft. As always, my name is Frugal. Thanks for watching.